Okay, yes, you're welcome, and I'll go ahead and get started. <clears throat> so th these slides are a lot of beautiful uh, paint images of paintings uh, in this slideshow because I gave this slideshow this past summer and fall in conjunction with the exhibit that was at, at Bennington and at the Southern, Southern Vermont Art Center that would be uh, Lyman Orton's personal collection of Vermont landscape paintings. So for those slides, I incorporated some of his um, his collection in the slideshow. And so you'll see some of those. I, I didn't take them out. And this is one of them. This is uh, Wallace Fainstock's Dorset Valley. So he really collected most outliers on either side, but mostly 1930s, 1960s, 70 summer people who summered in Vermont and painted the Vermont landscape. OK. This is another image. Um, so all these quintessential sort of Vermont scenes, mountains in the distance, usually uh, painted in the summertime when everything is green and lush. And there's another one, uh, Dorset Hollow by Jones, just these beautiful paintings. So, and these all resonate with us as Vermonters. We know these landscapes, maybe more importantly than knowing these landscapes, we know the representation of the Vermont landscape that we see in paintings like this. Vermont is portrayed in a certain way and not portrayed in other ways. And as a historian, I'm interested in why that is, why we portray Vermont one way and not another way. So when I teach Vermont history, I always ask my students to fill in the blanks. Vermonters are or Vermont is. And how, what would you folks say today about that? Vermonters are, it's always no matter where I give this talk, it's the same answers every time. Vermonters are what? Hard workers. Hardy. Hardy. <laughs> Hard workers. Stubborn. Stubborn. <laughs> Adventurous. OK. And Vermont is? Green. Green. Breathtaking. Although, breathtaking. Gentle. Gen OK. Although right now it's not green. But yes, the, the image of Vermont is a green Vermont. You're right. And so uh, Vermonters are hardy. They're resourceful. We're rugged. We like to think that we're independent, that we don't need anyone's help. Um, and all of these ideas, really, you can trace them back to the earliest white settlement in Vermont. You can trace those ideas back to Ethan Allen and his self-promotion of himself and what he said about himself. Whether or not any of that is true is a different conversation. But this is what we like to believe to be true about ourselves. So I'm interested in questions such as, are those traits fixed, or have they changed over time? Have Vermonters always thought that we were rugged and hardy, or has that changed? Um, often we say Vermonters are stoic, kind of quiet. Is that always the way it's been, or is, is that uh, an evolution over time? How many of these perceived human character traits can be traced to the natural environment? And would a change in landscape then mean a change in our shared self-perception? So if we think we're rugged and hardy and climate change comes along and it's no longer very cold here in the winter, which this winter has not been a very exciting winter, um, does that, do we still think in 100 years that we're rugged? Or do we say, gosh, those people in Florida are the rugged ones withstanding that heat down there? Um, and, and so that the, all these questions are really interesting to me. So when you're talking about the earliest white colonization of Vermont, you have to ask, how did those new arrivals feel to arrive in this landscape? How did those outside Vermont feel about this new settled area by uh, white colonizers, and how did they talk about that? And whose perspective gets recorded for history? So whose take on what it meant to be in Vermont at the earliest settlement period, whose take uh, do we remember? And is Ethan Allen a clue? to a shared sort of perception and a shared experience, or is Ethan Allen more of an anomaly? So when you're talking about the term Vermont, Vermont does get credit for being the first state actually named after um, the natural environment. And um, if you know early Vermont history, you know there was a bit of a debate about what Vermont means. Is that short? Is it a, a um, two words put together. Reverend Samuel Peters said that really it was Verdmont, uh, not Vermont, which he translated roughly as mountain of maggots, which got him into a lot of hot water <laughs> with other Vermonters at the time. 
And then if you know about sort of colonial history, you know that in early New England, historians for a long time talked about white settlers as arriving in a howling wilderness or perceiving their new home to be a howling wilderness. So is that what was going on in Vermont or was it something different? So one of the earliest images of Vermont is Ralph Earle's 1798 view of Bennington, which is down at the Bennington Museum. And you can see here, this doesn't much look like a howling wilderness, does it? What words would you throw out to describe this landscape? Cozy, Cozy. bucolic, settled, cultivated. It looks like the kind of place your kids could get an education, the kind of place you could find a doctor, you could find goods and services. The architecture is in the latest fashion. Everything is white and the mountains form the backdrop of the scene. And so one interesting question for me is what role did that mountain range play to the people of Bennington? Um, was it just a backdrop? Did they think it some, some, had something to do with who they thought they were? So when you get into the 19th century, particularly the 1820s to 1860, right before the Civil War, when you do Vermont history, you talk a lot about um, white settlement and those ideas of Vermonters being rugged, being independent, being lovers of liberty, being imbued with common sense, more common sensible than other people, they liked to think. Um, and you see outsider and insider views and tensions where people outside of Vermont don't have such a rosy take on Vermont and Vermonters. And also interesting to me is that the mountains are talked about as a sociable landscape. So for example, in the 1840s and 50s, you might find accounts of wintertime being a good time to visit the other farms because there's not a lot of work to do and the sleighing is really good. And so why don't you just go out and visit? And that really does a 180 degree shift by the early 20th century and we no longer talk about Vermont as a sociable landscape. So some viewpoints from non-Vermonters include Charles Eldridge, a traveler who arrived in Montpelier, where they had recently settled on Montpelier as the state capital after going back and forth about it. And he found the choice of Montpelier as the capital to be less than geographically satisfying, complaining, turn the eye in whatever direction, and mountains obstruct the view. You almost feel shut up from the world, imprisoned. That's 1833. Today, we would not go to Montpelier and say, oh, we feel confined, we feel imprisoned, these mountains are making us claustrophobic, but this is what this guy in 1833 felt about it. So when you look at references like that, and this is not the only such reference from the time period, you have to ask what is going on here. Part of what may be going on here is this aesthetic coming out of Europe, the idea that mountains are not symmetrical and asymmetrical is not the goal, and you don't want an aesthetic that threatens the symmetry. If you think of the architecture at the time, you could slice it in half and both of the sides are supposed to match and things are supposed to be symmetrical. You combine that idea with long-standing ideas of the wilderness as dangerous and newer 19th century ideas from outsiders like Charles Eldridge that Vermonters are provincial, they're backward, they're ignorant, and that may or may not have something to do with the landscape that they live in. So an interesting um, take comes from the Watrous family of Montpelier. So not a visitor to Montpelier, but Montpelier folk. And uh, this is a, a stanza from a poem written by one woman of the Watchers family. And this is a watercolor done by the other. And the title of the watercolor is The Village of Montpelier Taken from Mill Point in Berlin. And here you again see, like Ralph Earle's more high style painting, a uh, mountain range forming the backdrop and the buildings that you need for civil society. The courthouse there, um, some public buildings, the river, and obviously the river is not only for travel, but for water power, for early industries. So again, is this a backwater? Is this a provincial place? Is this a place that perceives of itself in the 1830s as on the rise, on the make? Um, and then the stanza from the poem, born free is the mountain air we breathe, while the wilderness meanwhile budded and blossomed as the rose. So this idea that we are lovers of freedom because we breathe the air of freedom, this is huge. People say this throughout um, the 19th century um, and into the 20th century. This is a really cool watercolor um, from 1825 of Cavendish, 
And I really like this because, again, this is the uh, unknown painter's portrayal of life in Cavendish. And is this person presenting a stylized, sort of romanticized take on Cavendish? Or is this like, here's what I see on this day that I paint this, which is what I think you see going on here. Um, and so you see some people in the foreground, and you see typical architecture for a place like Cavendish in 1825. What I really like about this, here's a really cool federal style building, is that this is right before Greek Revival takes over and dominates Vermont. And as you know, Greek Revival, your one and a half story cape with the return end gable and the um, central door, and maybe you have an L with an L door to the mudroom. That is a quintessential Vermont architecture and this predates that so it's pretty interesting um, but again the mountain range in the backdrop uh, forms a backdrop is it just there because it's literally there or um, if you had asked the folks who lived in these buildings if they thought those mountains contributed in some way to their experiences what they would have said so here's another um, this is Hope's Clarendon Springs this is from a little later this is the 1860s and again, it was Hope, um, I think Hope was probably painting for us what he saw, what he perceived, and the mountains uh, have a dominant presence in this painting. So Herman Melville weighed in on all of this in Moby Dick, writing of the scores of green Vermonters and New Hampshire men, all a thirst for gain and glory. Many are as green as the green mountains whence they came. So in the early passages of Moby Dick, if you read Moby Dick, it's said in New Bedford, this international whaling community, and there are people from all over the world, and there's just a lot of diversity. And among those diverse uh, peoples are these Vermont boys who come in to find work on whaling ships. And they're not being labeled as green because they're environmentally aware. They're green because they're ignorant, they're clueless. But nevertheless, it doesn't stop them from saying, I've never seen the ocean, but here I am. I'm ready to jump on a whaling ship and go and work for you. He also referred to those Vermont boys as bumpkin dandies. So they thought they were fashionable, but they were really bumpkins. But they were too bumpkinish to realize that they weren't really, they weren't as cool as they thought they were, right? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so a, a Vermonter himself who sided with Charles Eldridge and these people who were putting sort of less than flattering spins on Vermont was a farmer by the name of James Vaughn who longed to get out of Vermont. He wanted to, lead, to escape this cold, rough, mountainous northeast corner of the globe and go somewhere else if it is even to hell or Texas. We will not stop where God never ironed or even took his rolling pin across the mountains to smooth them. So that's 1845. This guy wants to get the heck out of Vermont. And that's a dominant narrative that you hear at the time, that your cousins have gone west. And at the time, west might be, at first it's upstate New York, and then it might be Ohio, and then it might be Wisconsin. And people are writing back to you, why are you staying in Pittsfield? Why? It's rocky. It's hilly. You can't grow the crops that, you know, that we can out here in Ohio. We just throw down the wheat, and it grows, and there's a great market for it. What are you doing? come out with us. And a lot of Vermonters really wanted to leave. And if they had the opportunity, they did. And if like this guy, they were waiting around and maybe didn't feel like the time was right or they couldn't leave yet, they felt bitter about it and they did not want to be here. Uh, Vermonter David Schofield did get out in the 1850s, a decade later, and he wrote back about um, dragging his feet for so long. And he said, I feel almost provoked with myself when I look around here, Wisconsin, and see land spread out before me and nothing to do but to put in the plow and you will have a crop of corn without hoeing. And then think how we've been hanging on to a little strip of land in Vermont, not wide enough to swing a cat around without dashing her brains out against the hills. A really graphic imagery, right? But I mean, that's what the Charles Eldridge, the visitor to Montpelier, would have said. Like, oh, this place is so claustrophobic, so surrounded by mountains, you couldn't even swing a cat by the tail without the cat hitting the hill. Uh, okay. So those are male perspectives on pre-Civil War Vermont. We also have to look at what women thought about Vermont. That's harder to find an answer to uh, in the archives. But the, these two images are of Frozen Charlotte. Does anybody know the song or the poem Frozen Charlotte? So um, a guy from Maine, Seba Smith, gets a credit for penning the poem 
Frozen Charlotte, which was then set to music and spread without migrating New Englanders westward. And so it was a very well-known song. And in the early 20th century, when song catchers were recording traditional music, they were finding a lot of different versions of Frozen Charlotte. And sometimes the lyrics are a little bit different. But um, and, and so this doll is, this little bisque doll is about the length of a finger. And this is called a Frozen Charlotte doll. And that's not the original name. That's a name that was given to them. And they were very inexpensive. And little girls played with them. And it uh, harkens back to the poem, which tells the story of Charlotte, who's getting ready for the New Year's Eve ball. And her escort is coming to take her. And her mother implores her, please cover up. It's you know freezing out. And she says, no, no, to cover up, I never will be seen. So her escort picks her up, and they go the 12 miles away to the next village to the ball. And as they're getting closer to the tavern, he thinks to himself, gosh, Charlotte's very quiet tonight, isn't she? And why do you think she's so quiet? Obviously, frozen to death. So it's a cautionary tale for young New Englanders to um, heed the dictates of nature rather than the whims and the fashions coming out of urban areas. And this was a real concern for Vermont parents at the time. You know, How do we keep our kids in Vermont, which is a really common concern that Vermont parents have today. And they had the same concern in the 1830s. How do we keep our kids here? How do we keep them um, from leaving? And one idea was, well, you teach them to respect the landscape. You have them um, ignore those dictates of fashion and realize it's New Year's Eve in Vermont and you need to bundle up if you're riding 12 miles in the sleigh. Um, and this actually, and this sheet music is not from, this tells the story of a different, a true story from Vermont of a, a young family, a, a man and a woman and their baby who got stuck going over, I can't remember where it was in southern Vermont, does anybody remember? And the, they got stuck and the man went for help and the um, woman froze to death and she wrapped the baby up and the baby survived and grew up uh, in Vermont. So there's also the really cool letters of a woman named Sally Rice, who was a, a farm girl from Dover, Vermont. And she leaves the family farm and goes to work on a farm in upstate New York. And she loves it. So it's not that she doesn't like farm work. She doesn't like Dover farm work. And she writes back to her parents, begging them to get out of Dover. She says, I can never be happy there in Dover, in among so many mountains. I feel as though I have worn out shoes and strength enough riding and walking over the mountains. I have but one life to live, and I want to enjoy myself as well as I can while I live. Do come away. Don't lay your bones in that place, I beg you. You know, that, the imagery of wearing out your shoes going up and down over this hillside farm. So vivid. And it's not that she didn't like farming. It's that she didn't like hill farming. She wanted out of Vermont. Okay, so when you go back to sort of the origins of a lot of this rhetoric, as I said, you're landing on the Green Mountain Boys, Ethan Allen, and that sort of first generation of white settlers. And you have to ask yourself, the environment that somebody like Ethan Allen constantly invoked, was that um, sort of a shaper of his character, or did he see that as symbolic of who he was? Like, I'm a rugged guy, and these are rugged hills, and so I'm going to say that there's a connection between us, or did he really think, like, I'm rugged because of these hills? And you have to remind yourself, as a way of answering that, that those guys didn't grow up here. They came from Connecticut, and they came up here. But they immediately um, took on this rhetoric of the rugged landscape as being um, representative of their own identities. And I really love this. This image, because this is a woodcut image in a history book published in 1839, I think, and it sh depicts two famous scenes in Green Mountain Boy lore. Does anybody know what these scenes are? Can anybody identify that? Why is that guy in the chair above the signpost? So that was a that was an incident that actually happened outside the Bennington Tavern. Um, at the Catamount Tavern in Bennington, where the Green Mountain Boys strung up this, uh, this doctor from Arlington who was a Yorker sympathizer. And they strung him up underneath the Catamount sign for the tavern, which featured a stuffed Catamount that had been shot in the area. 
and held him up there, you know, bullying him and torturing him because he had different political views than they did. And then the other image is the person strapped to the tree and somebody is whipping that person. And that, again, is a Yorker sympathizer in the Green Mountain Boys referred to that as the administering of the beach seal by whipping them with a, a, a beach. And so these are, this is an 1839 portrayal of things that had happened, you know, 50 years ago. Um, but what I love about it, two things, the mountains in the background, and you have to ask yourself, the, the artist who rendered this, is that again there just to be there, or is that some sort of symbolism explaining who these Green Mountain Boys were and what, they, what made them tick? And also the architecture, if you know what the Catamount Tavern actually looked like, and it burned in the 1860s, it was a, it was a Georgian building with very low squat with a hipped roof. This right here is your classic Greek revival with the return end pediment, tall vertical orientation. This is the architecture that dominated Vermont by 1839, by the time this image was created. But it's not actually the Catamount Tavern at all. So uh, no Vermonter of the 19th century gets more credit for perpetuating these images of Vermont and Vermonters as rugged uh, and tied to their landscape than Daniel Pierce Thompson, the Montpelier resident and author of famous um, historical fiction, including the novel The Green Mountain Boys, uh, which Vermonters, even through my mother's generation, were reading and were really familiar with that story. And so Daniel Thompson was a great fan of Vermont, a great fan of the sort of the founding generation, and he put his own spin on those guys and what they were all about. And this is a Thomas Waterman Wood portrait of Daniel Thompson that hangs at the Vermont Historical Society. And if you know about portraiture, you know that the artist often would put over the shoulder of the sitter some clue as to their wealth or their stature. So a lawyer might have some law books, or a successful merchant might have the wharf over his shoulder, something like that. And here we have Camel's Hump over Daniel Pierce Thompson's shoulder. And I think that's very intentional on Thomas Waterman Wood's part. He very much understands that Daniel Thompson is um, is tightly bound to ideas about the Vermont landscape. So Daniel Thompson, however, uh, when he was young, when he was what we call a college age kid, he wanted out of Vermont. He graduated later in life from Middlebury. It took him a few extra years. And then he went to work as a private tutor in Virginia. He loved living in Virginia. He kept up a lifelong correspondence with a cousin in Maine. And he wrote to that cousin saying, you know, I may never leave Virginia. I might even marry a southern girl. Who knows? His mom gets sick. He has to come back to Montpelier. Once he comes home to Montpelier, he never leaves. And he starts that lifelong project of um, telling the story of Vermont's founding and tying it to shared character traits into the landscape. Um, the younger cousin in Maine thought about leaving, did leave for a while, and then came home to Maine. So Daniel Thompson writes to his pen pal cousin in Maine, the brother of the guy who had left, and he says, I'm really glad your brother decided to come home. He says, I am satisfied that a New England man living here to the age of maturity will always be too much influenced by the effects of early associations to live happily in the South or West for permanent residence as in New England. To such settled in other countries, the birds do not sing so sweet, the foliage of the trees does not present so beautiful an appearance, nothing is so fair, so pleasant, as fancy is forever telling him are the things of our early home, and the heart is always sending up its little regrets for reason to stifle, and the mind, in spite of that reason, will turn back, and the memory linger on the mountains of New England. How would we summarize what Daniel Thompson is saying there? Has anybody ever heard of the branch of psychology called environmental psychology? Environmental psychologists look at the um, little kids ages five, six, seven, and they argue that that landscape of that child is the primary landscape of that person's life. So you might live in Vermont as an adult, but you might be from Arizona. You might love the Vermont landscape, but if you grew up in Arizona, that's always landscape number one. In your, in your mind, that's like what's normalized for you. And this is sort of a field of psychology today, how kids um, imprint on the landscape and um, the landscape imprints on children and what that's all about. And Daniel Thompson doesn't have that language to describe it in that way in the middle part of the 19th century, but that's very much what he's talking about. You cannot grow up in New England and leave and ever truly be happy. You can think you'll be happy, but you won't really ever be happy um, this is, if this is your primary landscape. 
So, environment, contentment, and manhood. And I'm particularly interested in how men navigated this idea of Vermont as home. And if Vermont is home, can you pick up and leave? Remember, Vermonters up to the Civil War are migrating in droves. They're all going west. If you personally don't want to go, but it doesn't make financial sense to stay on the hill farm instead of going with your cousin and farming in Ohio, you can't stand your ground on an economic argument, you have to come up with a different argument. And so what these guys do is craft this argument of the landscape as home. If the landscape, if Pittsfield is your home, it's not portable. If the little Greek arrival house across the street is home, you can pack up, you have your belongings, your mom and your dad and your siblings, you can all go to Ohio and live in a new Greek arrival house and home is portable in that way. But if the landscape forms your home, you can't leave. So one thing that these guys are doing, and this is like early capitalism, remember, where to be a man is to be, uh, you'd have gumption and have a, be acquisitive and be ambitious and be on the make and go west, young men, and all of that stuff. If you don't feel that and you want to stay in Pittsfield, but it doesn't make economic sense to stay in Pittsfield, you have to harken back to an earlier idea of contentment. So those early settlers talked about having a um, subsistence, bare bones enough to survive. That might be the first year that you're in Pittsfield, the first year or so. And then you want uh, a sufficiency. You want to be, to be more, like a little bit comfortable, not just scraping by, maybe a little bit to set aside. And ideally, you want to achieve a competency, which is a level of comfort that means you're maybe even going to have something to pass on to your kids one day. So these Vermont men living in a time of emerging capitalism start to say, hey, wait a second. I want to just be content. To be content is enough. And James Johns is a great example of that. He was a guy from Huntington, and he uh, wrote a book of poetry in 1828. The book is called A Home Among the Green Mountains, Preferable to Emigration. So he's talking to his fellow Vermonters who are all leaving. You know, this is better. This is home. This is better. And he says, "'Tis here in Vermont, the land of green mountains, I choose to remain contented to dwell among the green mountains, the lofty green mountains, the cloud-capped green mountains, contented to dwell." So that's a radical argument by 1828 to call for a contentment. Like, no, guys, I know I get it. Thanks, I reject that. I don't want to do that. Um, and so that's what you see these Vermont guys doing. And that doesn't necessarily mean they, you know, weren't ambitious and wishing they had wealth and wishing to accumulate and all of that. But the rhetoric, the public rhetoric, is all about being satisfied with enough. So you stay here, this is your home, and it may not make you wealthy, but that's enough. So you fast forward a couple of decades and you get to my friend Nelt Morse out of Randolph. Nelt's father was dead, and so he ran the hill farm in Randolph. He had a mom and a little sister and a younger brother. The younger brother leaves the hill farm to go out to California to sow his oats and see what he can make, um, what he can make of himself. And Nelt writes to him shortly after his departure, and he, he reflects on a chore. He's pulling, he's hauling manure from the barn and bringing it up to the pasture. And he says, from the, view of the, from the view of the pasture, this was the wrong place. I could see too much of the old farm. How many times we had lifted and toiled side by side. Could it be that you were aboard the old North Star headed out west? Oh God, you might be taking your last look at the old New England hilltops. I own Dane, it was too much for me. I have no doubt, but if that monster ambition had stood before me then, one or the other of us would have been demolished in an instant. So here's a guy talking about, like, ambition is a powerful thing. It can make you wealthy. It, can, it assures that you've got the get up and go, that you're going to go make something of yourself. But it also has the power to destroy families. It's a monster in that way. He says, if I had that monster ambition, I would just come to you. I would have gone to you. I don't want to be apart from you. Nelt Morse might be like this kind of farmer. This is Erwin Hoffman's Vermont Harvest. This is one of those um, early 20th century landscape paintings done mostly by summer people. But here this guy is portraying this sort of solitary farmer set in the landscape. And this reminds me of guys like Nelt Morse. Similarly, here's Jerome Thompson's uh, 1861 Mount Mansfield, Vermont. This is a young farm kid sitting on the fence looking at Mount Mansfield in the distance. I don't read this as like 
um, expressing discontentment with his lot in life, or really of even like expressing a desire to be up there on the mountain, which today a lot of Vermonters like want to be up on the last of the ski season. This guy is letting the mountains form the distant view. He may or may not think like this is home, this is like the essence of who I am as a person, but it's a view shed, it's a viewscape. It forms the distant view. These people weren't talking about summiting mountains, recreating on mountains. By the 1860s, tourists were recreating on the New England mountains, including Mount Mansfield, including the White Mountains. But for these Vermont guys, they're not talking about summiting, conquering, recreating, any of that stuff that we might associate today with Vermont landscapes. Um, and this is a 20th century image. This is Childs, the Sentinels of the Valley. And again, sort of pasture land with mountains forming the distant view. And this is an iconic image that goes on um, throughout the history of white settlement in Vermont. <laughs> Academic Christopher Apap has written about the sectional picturesque in a book about American literature. And in that book, he talks about the Vermont character in Catherine Mariah Sedgwick's novel Redwood from 1824. This fictional Vermont girl says in that book, I confess I have prejudices so strong in favor of our lofty mountains, deep valleys, and broad lakes that I do not believe I could ever admire the tame level of Carolina. She's being told she has to go to the Carolinas and she's, she doesn't want to go. She's quite certain she's never gonna like it. Again, um, environmental psychology. So we don't talk a lot about indigenous people uh, when we talk about Vermont landscape identity and the rhetoric around it. We certainly know that indigenous people before the artificial political border were coming from Quebec into Vermont. And um, in my town in Morrisville, this is an image of two high school graduates who the weeks, in the weeks after graduating from the high school found an old dugout in an outlet of a local pond. And they pulled that out and brought it to our historical society and declared that it was Indian Joe's canoe of um, Joe's Pond of Danville and a lot of different communities in Vermont claim um, this man named Joe. And similarly, you get a lot of stories in, this, in um, Vermont histories, and this is a Vermont woman in Franklin County proudly displaying a basket in the 1970s that had been passed down in her family, and the story she told was my ancestors, uh, some, you know, some people in, passing through Franklin County headed back to Quebec, and they um, traded us this basket for corn. And we gave them some corn, and they gave us the basket, and here we pass the basket down in the family. So you get all of these stories. And if you ask the people in Odenak today, for example, the Abnaki and Odenak, they will readily tell you about their history in this landscape that we call Vermont and how they used this space um, historically. Okay. So, but more than that, what, what we get are these... Um, reminiscences, these interpretations by uh, white Vermonters, including Charles Adams out of Burlington, who said in 1860, above all the demonstrations of science and art, its sublime works of the infinite were spread out in the grandeur of the Adirondacks on the one side and Mansfield and Camel's Height on the other and gave evidence that nature in her grandest mood had scattered these emblems of might to beckon man onward in the path of industry to the highest point of civilization. Right, that white idea that dominated the 19th century, that this land is for us, it was made ready for us, we are the next level, we're the next best thing, we're on the march of progress, the march towards civilization. And so if the, uh, you know, that indigenous people of Quebec no longer come down here, you know, so be it, it's probably for the best, that idea that we're on a pro progressive march towards civilization. And that sort of story is much more dominant in the archives. So when you get to the late 19th, early 20th century Vermont, it's what Vermont historians for a long, long time referred to as the winter of Vermont, meaning Vermont was sort of quiet, sleeping. All those ambitious guys had left. They'd all gone west. And the people left behind were the old folk, the unambitious. Vermont was a sleepy backwater. Vermont did not have a thriving economy. And so it was the winter of Vermont. So a place, time forgot, a backwater. The mountains are not useless, but they are unused. Vermonters are provincial and isolated. Neither of those things are positive. And you start to have new voices call out for new recreational uses of those landscapes, 
And Vermonters are seen as models of resourcefulness, but also as odd characters. And the way I think about that is, by the time you get to the 1920s, it's all about the cult of personality. To be extroverted is to be it. To be introverted suddenly is to be a weirdo, an oddball. And so um, if you are a taciturn, quiet Vermonter, you 100 years earlier, somebody might have said, oh, you're a man of great character. By the 1920s, you're not a man of great character from the viewpoint of these people looking at you. You are yourself a character, which means you're odd, you're weird, you don't quite fit in, you're certainly not an extrovert, you're certainly not the life of the party or any of these positive things that we think of. So Vermonters become characters. This is the sort of landscape that I think of from that time period. This is Tabor's Mount Mansfield in winter. You see one guy and some animals um, in the landscape, but otherwise it's pretty quiet, pretty isolated, pretty sleepy, not a lot going on. And this is a 20th century image um, that you know, shows some people sledding down the hill. But again, the sort of landscape in winter, this idea that Vermont is a place that the rest of the world has kind of forgotten about. This bothers Vermonters like James Paddock Taylor, the founder of the Green Mountain Club, who says in the early 20th century that every true Vermonter is a mountaineer and the genius of the state is the spirit of the mountains. He looks around at the mountains and he says, unclimbed, they have made a commonwealth of valley dwellers, complacent and provincial, not good things. Undeveloped, they have fostered local conservatism and narrowness of interest. Unrevered, they, had, they have cultivated in us all an excess of individuality, and so the mountains have had their revenge on us. We have misinterpreted our mountains. We have stayed close in the valley, content to be a valley people, each feeling that his mountain-fringed plot is a world. A lot of those 19th century guys, like uh, James Johns, content at home among the mountains, he would have said, yeah, so what? This is my world. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with the mountains forming the distant vista? I feel no need to summit them. I feel no need to conquer them. But you get to the early 20th century, and Vermonters are saying, what a waste of space. What an unused potential. Why aren't we summiting? Why aren't we recreating? Why aren't we, for example, building roads up there, bringing more tourism up to the mountains? And we know in the 1930s, there was a debate over the proposed Green Mountain Parkway, which would have been modeled after the Blue Ridge Parkway um, and would have brought tourism along the summits of Vermont. And it was a close call, and it did not pass. It ultimately never came to be. And it really bothered uh, Vermonters at the time. And Vermonters ever since, Vermont historians ever since, have sort of talked about the proposed parkway as, whew, whew we dodged a bullet. Good thing that never happened. And it's only been in like the last 10 years that I've heard some Vermonters say, eh, would that really have been such a bad thing? Is the Blue Ridge Parkway really that awful? Would it have prevented the ski, the ski tourism that we have now on the summits instead, which now we have, you know, veil buying the mountains? Like, is that a good thing? Would this really have been so awful in comparison to what we do have? So those are really interesting questions that uh, Vermonters I've only heard in the last decade or so starting to ask. So in the 1920s, writers of Hind Humphrey um, knew all about this lore of the Green Mountain Boys and the Green Mountain Boys and the landscape and the Green Mountain Boys as rugged and hardy and Ethan Allen bragging that he wrestled catamounts with his bare hands and bragging that he could bend nails with his teeth and all these things. And she says of that cherished state historiography of fiery and outspoken pioneers, ah, there's doubtless much truth in this picture of early Vermont, but it cannot be the whole truth or the contemporary Vermonter, only a few generations removed from those forebears, would not be the restrained, taciturn creature he is. She's looking at those neighbors, those neighbors in the, quote, winter of Vermont, those neighbors who seem to lack ambition, seem to lack the get up and go, seem to be quiet, aren't particularly outspoken, aren't social, aren't extroverts, and saying, that stuff about Ethan Allen cannot have been accurate because his great-great-grandson lives across the street from me, and that guy is so socially awkward he won't even look you in the eye when he sees you. So this is, this is the dominant sort of perception of Vermonters in the early 20th century, um, that they're awkward, 
that they're isolated and introverted and that they are like that because of the landscape. Not the landscape that fosters sociability in winter with slaying to your neighbors and going to New Year's balls at the tavern, none of that. The landscape that makes you so sort of withdrawn into yourself, so uncomfortable even in the presence of lifelong neighbors um, that you just can't really operate in polite society. And that's where you get Vermont tourism pamphlets saying, come to Vermont, we want you to come Vermont to Vermont. Should you drive into the ditch, uh, don't worry about it. The farmer's going to bring his tractor and pull you out. If he seems really grumpy and annoyed the whole time, don't take it personally. If he doesn't speak to you the whole time, don't take it personally. That's just how he is. That's a Vermont thing. He really does love you. He really does want you here you know, even if it doesn't seem like it. Trying to bridge that sort of divide while building a tourist economy, which is really uh, thriving at the state level. This is a new uh, endeavor for them with sort of what they perceive to be the realities of the people out in places like Pittsfield, who maybe to all perceptions don't really seem too excited to have the visitors. Speaking in the New Republic in an article called Rock Ribbed, Bluce Blyman said, um, that Vermonters cannot speak of this, we are as mute as our hills. We cannot explain to you who we are. Um, and so you get that idea of like the granite forming the very uh, bones of your body, like your ribs being formed of granite. This is a dominant idea by the early 20th century that Vermonters like are made of granite. And because they're made of granite, like they can't speak. And they're so stoic. And they're so lacking in social skills. This is that kind of guy. This is Arthur Rothstein, the photographer for the FSA, who came to Vermont on mission during the Depression. And he took this photo of a man named Sam Alexander, a stonemason out of Hyde Park. And so this is the kind of guy that people are on the look for. Who are these stoic, quiet, made of the very granite of the rocks? Who are these guys? This guy, who even works with the stone. He's a stonemason. And of course, we're putting that onto him. This guy maybe could have been very chatty if you saw him. But the perception of him is of uh, rock ribbed and stoic and quiet and taciturn and lacking in social skills. This is Ruth Green Mold, the uh, painter from Vermont. Uh, this is her Granite Hills from 1939, which hangs at the Bennington Museum. And I really love it in the text next to the painting at the Bennington Museum has a quote from Ruth Mould who, uh, to the curator at, of the Bennington Museum at the time when she sent this painting down. And she refers to this guy who apparently was the cemetery caretaker in Johnson, Vermont, as being the stuff of the hills and having the granite, sort of like the granite, just all that rhetoric. And she puts that right onto this guy. Like the cemetery guy, like he's one of these old Vermont guys. and. He's got the rocks, like he's formed of the very essence. I forget the language of it, but it's really great how she describes it, that, that he's got the, the, the landscape in his veins. And that's why he doesn't have any social skills. You do get some different perceptions at the time. This is a, one of those summer artist's paintings of a farm. And here you do see an image of sociability. I think it's probably more family sociability rather than neighborly sociability. But you, you have people talking, people cooperating, people working together to get jobs done. But this sort of image um, is not dominant throughout most of the 20th century. Instead, you get this. This is Francis Colburn's landscape with barn. This is uh, Bolton, Vermont. And I love this image and the, the, the rocky, jagged hills. It's not peopled. It doesn't seem like a very welcoming or inviting environment. It seems like to survive there, yes, you would have to be rugged. You would have to be hardy. Edward Arthur Rockwood, writing in the Vermont Review, listed six character traits of the Vermonter. He said, the Vermonter has a love of beauty, is resourceful, is thrifty, um, has a genius, a natural genius quality, and um, has an austerity and a loyalty. And he said, our hearts are never carried on our sleeves. The Vermonter does not mean to be cool, indifferent, austere. It is merely one of his idiosyncrasies, one of his Vermontisms. He can't help it. He might want to chat with you, but he just can't. <laughs> 
And again, this is gendered. This perception of Vermonters is largely male and of a certain age. Paul Sample married a Vermonter um, and had a career at Dartmouth College. And this is his Beaver Meadow from the Upper Valley, 1939. I really love this painting because you can see these people, and it's multi-generational. These people's lives, I think we as viewers are meant to understand that their lives take place right in this scene. They uh, marry in the church, the funeral's held in the church, they're buried in the cemetery behind the church. These people have probably known each other their entire lives, yet does it seem like it's very sociable? Is anybody making eye contact with anybody else? No eye contact. What, um, uh, visual artists call the intersection of gazes. Just all the eyes are crossing each other. No one, no one is looking at each other. So the way I read this is these people have known each other their entire lives and they can't even look each other in the eye. Why not? Because of the landscape. It's done this to them. This is a people-less version of a similar landscape. This is DeWitt's uh, covered bridge fall. And um, this is a 20th century portrayal of one of these um, sort of uh, community center areas surrounded by mountains. This is another Paul sample. This is church supper from 1933. Church suppers are supposed to be sociable times for folks. And um, for the most part, people are not looking at each other but if they are looking, they're looking at who? who? Who are they looking at there? Yes, this scantily clad woman entering the scene. Who's that? She's not from around here. And they're sort of looking. Some of them are sneaking a glance. Otherwise, people are looking at their plates. They're not looking at each other. An interesting take on what it means to be a community member at the church supper. This is um, one of Lyman Orton's paintings. This is by uh, Kira Markham, and this is called Family Restaurant. And as of uh, this past summer, he was putting out a call trying to identify who these people are because Markham was one of these summer painters, and she is known for painting real people, not just representations. And uh, Lyman Orton was trying to figure out who these folks may have been. Um, and this is a different kind of scene. It's called Family Restaurant. It's much more sociable. People are making eye contact. There's a warmth to it that you don't see in the Paul Sample paintings. Um, and the title, Family Restaurant, maybe these people are all related. Um, hard to say. But Kira Markham also did this one, which I absolutely love, Two Women, which is much more sort of on point with portrayals of Vermonters in the mid 20th century. These two women, are they mother, daughter, perhaps, who knows? And just sort of the, these aging bodies set in a rocky aging landscape and they're not looking at each other, they're not communicating at all. And it really uh, raises questions about what their relationship might be like and are they able to have a different relationship if those mountains form their backdrop. You get similar uh, paintings out of New Hampshire. This is Clarence, uh, Edward Clarence Dean's High Farm and this sort of um, regionalist style from the 1930s, a peopleless landscape. No, doesn't look particularly warm and cozy or bucolic or anything like that. Looks kind of like a hard place to make a go of it. Um, maybe a little unforgiving and no humans in the scene. Speaking in 1932, uh, Bernard DeVoto, the writer, said of Vermonters and the Depression, in answer to the question, how have Vermonters withstood the Depression, he said, well, by the granite they have lived on for three centuries, tightening their belts and hanging on. Like they just live on granite. They are of granite. They are one and the same. Uh, for a long time, Vermont historians said that Vermonters ah, were pretty okay during the Depression. We now know that's not true. Vermonters suffered. Everybody suffered during the Depression. Vermont was interested in federal assistance, just like every place else was interested in federal assistance. You may have been less hungry if you grew up on a farm than if you were, uh, say, an, an urban kid in downtown Barrie or Rutland whose you know, family worked in the granite industry or something. You may have felt the Depression more harshly in that second family. But this idea that 
if you lived on a farm, you just weathered the depression and you didn't know any different, is something that historians have really dismantled in recent years. George Aiken, our very own famous politician, also weighed in on Vermont ideals. He listed Vermont ideals as a love of liberty, strong self-reliance, appreciation of thr thrift, liberalism, all leading to self-respect. Why do folks live in the hills? He said, well, the reason is that some folks just naturally love the mountains and like to live up among them where freedom of thought and action is logical and inherent. If you're a lover of freedom and personal liberty and you live in the hills, how can you be anything but a lover of freedom and personal liberty? Because those hills are, um, they give that to you. They give those traits to you. So it's inherent. You can't grow up in the hills without being that way, George Aiken said. And, you, and a lot of people said the same thing during the Civil War. Why do Vermonters oppose slavery? Well, because we live among the hills. How could we ever tolerate slavery? We know the reality of Vermonters and racism and slavery was much more complicated and different than that. And there were certainly a lot of Vermonters who were just fine with slavery. Um, but the rhetoric, anyway, the public spin was that, oh no, we can't stomach such an institution. That's terrible. That's a lack of freedom. We live among the hills. We therefore are staunch defenders of freedom. So here's another FSA government photo. This is Jack Delano this time uh, taking pictures in, the, in 1941 at the Tombridge World's Fair. And this is a sort of stoic, weathered Vermont guy set in the landscape, the kind of guy who Aiken probably thought would possess these ideals. Or perhaps Erwin Hoffman's Vermont Farmer, also um, you know, a portrait alone of a guy um, taken inside this time, but you can sort of infer his relationship to the landscape. <clears throat> this one is a fun one. This is Roland Rochette, who's a French Canadian farmer um, in Greensboro Bend. And he did these sort of primitive style pieces, and sometimes they're multimedia, they have sticks of wood and things on them. They're very collectible today. Um, and this is his sugaring. And so it's uh, one human doing agricultural labor set in the landscape alone, isolated, no social interaction. So it's the same sort of like working the landscape alone and having that be what you, you spend your time on. And these are um, unknown artists. These are actually in my house when we bought it. I don't know who did these, but it's the same sort of mid 20th century, inspired probably by Grandma Moses kind of idea of isolated people set in the landscape. And I'm really interested in the voices that aren't so dominant, voices, uh, narratives about Vermont and Vermonters um, that are, we don't necessarily hear. And as somebody, I'm from Barrie, and I'm really interested in those immigrants who came to work in the granite industry and what Barrie meant to them. Um, and so Luigi Lucioni, the famous painter, um, was Italian. He had relatives in Barrie, so he came to Barrie to visit. He said of Barrie, it was like seeing the mountains of my birthplace. I was reborn in this majestic setting, and I fell in love with Vermont, which is a really cool kind of take on, on Barrie, which is in what we call the Piedmont area of Vermont. And there are hills all around Barrie. And to Luigi Lucioni, he comes to Barrie, and he's like, oh, look. This looks a little bit like home, a little bit like northern Italy. And so we don't know for certain what those Italians who arrived in Barrie in 1890 would have said, but maybe they would have said something similar, like, oh, maybe this, this isn't totally awful. This is a little bit like home. And this is his Barrie granite shed, which hangs at the Brooklyn Museum. And this is his birches, which is one of the paintings acquired by Lyman Orton. It's beautiful. So I only have one photo in this slideshow representing those hippies, those back to the land kids of the 60s and 70s. But in terms of their influence in the story that I'm telling, imagine I have 500 pictures of back to the land hippies working the landscape because they have shifted so much the narrative of what we think Vermonters are and what we think our relationship to the landscape is. And so you have to remember, these guys show up in Vermont. They find a lot of aging farmers, these stoic, taciturn guys. Their own kids have left. Thanks, no thanks, I have no interest in being a farmer. I'm gonna go someplace else. Uh, these farmers are aging, they have skills. These 
um, urban suburban kids from out of state, college educated, are rejecting the suburban experiences of their parents. They want something new. They want something different. They befriend these old farmers. And if you look at a lot of the oral histories that have been, been done of these back to the land people now, they will say, well, when we arrived in, you know, 72, we found the farmer down the street and his kids were all grown up and he taught us how to plow and he did all these things. So there's really like a, a passing down of skills uh, between generations, um, and these people come into Vermont looking for something different than what they've had. And so a lot of what, what you poll, you know, person on the street today, if you went to a different state and you said, tell me the top five things you think of when I say Vermont, what are some of the things people might say today? Uh, Mountains. Skiing. skiing. Hippies. Hippies. Mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm like politics to the left of the Democratic Party. We owe all of Ben and Jerry's ice cream, uh, seventh generation, all these sort of green businesses that are like tied to the environment or have a, a public uh, persona as being um, environmentally minded. All of that stuff comes from these guys. Organic food, the organic food movement, co-ops, cooperative grocery stores, all of that stuff that we associate with Vermont today goes back historically no further than like the, the middle of the 1960s. It's really, really interesting. So these guys get outsized credit for shifting the narrative of what it means to be a Vermonter. And one thing I think they do is they put a more sociable spin on what it means to be a Vermonter, more of that old school 1840s, it's nice in winter because you can slay to the neighbors and hang out with your neighbors. The, these people are not promoting a Vermont landscape that's isolated, that's taciturn, that's withdrawn. They're not promoting this kind of Vermonter. They're promoting a new way, a new way forward. I'm um, oh, sorry. So they're meeting these old farmers, Fred Tuttle, obviously man with a plan of the late 1990s, which had a huge influence on Vermonters. And that guy, if you remember, Fred Tuttle, was probably literally like the great, great nephew or, or the nephew, rather, of this guy, you know, this Tumbridge guy. But he's a Tumbridge farmer in the 1990s who's so talkative, who's so extroverted that he wouldn't stop. You know, the image of Fred Tuttle is you meet him at the Tumbridge Fair and he'll talk your ear off or you have him on your TV show and he'll talk your ear off. Um, and so where did that come from and why did Vermonters sit in movie theaters all across the state in the late 1990s and watch these uh, portrayals of Fred Tuttle and be like, oh yeah, that resonates with me. I recognize that. I recognize that guy. I recognize what he represents. How did we do that 180 degree shift again to a Vermont landscape that breeds sociable, extroverted Vermonters like this? And what role did those back to the land kids play in shifting that narrative of what it means to be a Vermonter? I find all of that really, really interesting. And then more recently, sort of uh, landscape portrayals, obviously we've had fights over ridge lines, whether or not we should have wind turbines on ridge lines. Here's a free press image of um, wind turbines. Some people feel this desecrates mountaintops. Some people feel it's a good green energy use of mountaintops, that you could dismantle all of that, um, and then, you know, no harm, no foul. There's just a road up there. Um, Steve Wright, who has since passed away, um, right at, quoted in VT Digger in 2013, saying, it's affirmed a certain notion, that is, Vermont's emotional, economic, and ecological health comes from the mountains, and blowing up our mountains is a direct assault on our health. So a guy who was very opposed to these ridgeline turbine projects, why? Our whole essence of who we are comes from the mountains. You touch the mountains, you're touching the essence of who we are as a people. Really interesting. He's He's contributing to a rhetoric that's been going on for 200 years. Um, and then more recently, uh, Sherry Morse, a geography professor at UVM and I, ran a study in uh, 2016 polling Vermonters. This is pre-COVID. We have to remember before COVID all the political discussion about uh, the draining out of Vermont communities, the young people leaving, a lot of debates in uh, Montpelier, how do we get young people to stay? How do we get young people to come back if they've left? So Sherry and I polled Vermonters who have stayed, Vermonters who left, and Vermonters like my brother who've kind of gone back and forth. 
leave, come back, leave, come back. Um, and so for the stayers, the people who've stayed put, why did you stay? I enjoy the Vermont landscape. That beats out family. It beats out everything else. I enjoy the Vermont landscape. For returnees who left and came back, why'd you come back? Well, I missed my family. Right underneath that, I missed the landscape. And then for other reasons as well. They want to raise their kids here. Lots of different reasons. One of the anonymous participants of our poll said there's something in the soil and the upbringing of being raised in a place like Vermont. People have pride about where they're from, but it never is close to the level to which Vermonters feel pride. I miss the simplicity and the beauty. And that's debatable, right? Like you could ask somebody from New Mexico, like, do you feel pride to be from New Mexico? And they might be like, yes, absolutely. Northern California, yes, absolutely. Like as much as a Vermonter. But again, we Vermonters like to believe that we're exceptional, that, we, that our relationship with the landscape is somehow different, tighter, more intimate than other people's connections. And then we have COVID. And of course, COVID has really shifted this whole story. And this is a New York Times article from that very first year of COVID about uh, Wynn Hall, Vermont, and the changes to the real estate and how no one could find a place to live and the prices were going up and nobody could get goods and services. And Wynn Hall was experiencing all sorts of new neighbors who had um, come to Vermont to escape. COVID. And as we know, the real estate prices in every place in Vermont that I can think of are at least triple what they were in 2019. Um, and it, in my town in Vermont, there's no place to live. There are a couple of developers who are building four-story apartment complexes with 340 units in them in a village of 5,000 people. And the wait list to get into those units is, you know, could go all the way down the street. So what happens? How do we make Vermont affordable? How do we make Vermont affordable for our kids who grew up here when um, somebody with more money from Boston, for example, can outbid your children on housing? These are all new questions that are being asked, and there are no answers. But it's really shifted, even from the 2016 study we did, you know, where Phil Scott was like, how do we get Vermonters to stay in Vermont? Well, um, that's less of a question now. It's more like, if they want to stay, how are we going to make it possible for them to stay? OK, internal migration versus domestic migration. This is a VT Digger graphic from 2022 showing um, domestic migration just shooting right up in 2021. So people coming into Vermont from other parts of the United States. So, and this is a Rockwell Kent, Vermont Hills. This is one of the beautiful, amazing paintings um, that were on display this summer from that exhibit, that private collection. And so that's pretty much it. Well, thank you so much for coming out on a Saturday. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you.